Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Talco Talk. I'm Natasha Jacobs. The process of local loop and bundling or LLU has been a contentious issue in the South African telecommunications space for close to six years. Although steps have been taken to get unbundling off the ground, the process has been marred by delays. Joining me in studio today to give us some insight into LLU in the country is Kathleen Rice. She's Director of Technology, Media and Telecommunications Practice at Cliff Dacker Hofmeyer, Angus Hay, Chief Technology Officer at Neotel, Andre Hubert, General Manager, MWeb Business, and Rudolf Miller, Founder and Editor of My Broadband. Lady, gentlemen, welcome. Kathleen, I'm going to start with you. In May 2006, the late former Minister of Communications, Ivy Matsepi Kosaburi, put together the South African Local Look Committee. We've seen reports, we've had um, issues with stakeholders, the deadline of November 2011 has come and gone. Is it a case of lack of will or why are we seeing so many delays with the LLU process? It's difficult to say because it is a complicated process. Um, you're dealing with um, an entity, Telcom, that has established itself in the market. It's got a monopoly over the local loop and I guess they're wanting to treat quite carefully as far as Telcom is concerned and um, the debate over the best way to go about it and concerns about socio-economic effects I suppose are also a consideration but local loop unbundling has been unnecessarily delayed, it should have been implemented a considerable time ago um, because at this stage it's almost too little too late once uh, the ICASA has started the process of regulating it and actually implementing local loop unbundling. But you just said the word monopoly and that's the problem. Looking at international statistics, LLU usually takes place within two years of so-called liberalisation of the market. Players like Neotel have been around for quite some time. Again, is it lack of will? Because if the process should be proceeding so speedily, why why? Is it Telcom? Is it ICASA? What's going on? Well, ICASA, um, when they d they've recently conducted a local loop und unbundling discussion process and their findings at the end of that have been very lacklustre and unexciting for new entrants into the market. But surprisingly, with Neotel's recent complaint to ICASA, ICASA seems to have developed a backbone and has um, agreed with Neotel's contention that it is entitled to the local loop um, by virtue of the facilities leasing regulations. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen and if Telcom's going to accept that decision on part of ICASA or if it'll take it on review. She wrote up the complaint to ICASA ruling in your favour. We're yet to see yeah. the final final decision. Is that to tick one Neotel? Well, I think, I mean, first things first, we've always maintained that we want to follow a process that fits within a, a proper uh, regulatory framework. And we do certainly have a regulatory framework in place with the local, uh, the um, not not local loop unbundling, but with the facilities leasing guidelines. So, I mean, certainly we followed a process that's in line with what we believe the the regulations currently say, and we, you know, that's that's the approach we've been taking. And I think it's very much in line with the broader approach we've taken with the CASA itself and with other players in the industry. Is that we want a framework that works for everyone, um, and so we're following a process which we which we believe uh, is in line with regulation. Now, Andre, you guys also have not been quiet on the LLU front. Um, last year, you put out a response into the proposed ICASA framework. What is MWeb's stance on LLU? Well, look, we're obviously 100% in favour of it. Um, but we do believe that it should be in a phased approach. Um, and we're looking for some immediate wins. Um, as you say, the process has been very long, very tedious. Um, and the frustrating part is that there's some obvious immediate steps that can be taken. Um, that will make a real difference um, in the market from a service provider point of view. Um, and our approach has really been to drive a phased approach um, and start with some immediate wins. Before we get to those immediate wins, Rudolf, you literally deal with LLU <coughs> almost on a daily basis um, on your site. Is this the general consensus from the industry? Is this the people still believe that LLU is the way forward? Well, certainly it is. There's no doubt about it. Um, we have also seen that when competition comes into the market, um, it has a tremendous effect on pricing and on the kind of services that, that consumers get. Um, we have seen just through IP Connect, which is a kind of a forerunner to LLU, the introduction of IP Connect has made it possible for guys like MWeb to launch uncapped uh, ADSL services, which was, was not available in the market at the rates that we've seen. Since then, prices have plummeted. So. Better wholesale models and LLU will definitely make a difference uh, in our broadband market.
Now, Kathleen, a big point of contention with LLU in South Africa is whether the process should be facilitated through Chapter 8, and Angus brought it up earlier, the leasing agreements regulatory side. In an Italco industry that's forever changing, I mean, the ECA came in in 2005, a little before the LLU contention started. Is the regulatory framework perhaps a little bit behind in regards to what the industry needs and where it's going to? I think the facilities leasing regulations which are passed in terms of Chapter 8 are sufficient to deal with the issue of local loop unbundling. Um, mention is made of local loop unbundling and um, although Telcom would disagree with this view, the local loop is an essential facility or even an electronic communications facility that should be made available to competitors and that's the very pur purpose of the regulation. So, I think the Act is equipped to deal with local loop unbundling in the current framework. Now, Angus, with competitors such as yourself able to provide services despite not having access to Telcom's local loop, is it not a case of too little too late? Are we pushing for something that is actually not needed? Again, I think you know, a number of people have said it. There, there isn't really such a thing as too little too late when you're talking about the scale of facilities that we're dealing with. So to come back to the, the, the point, in, in terms of the Act, the facilities leasing guidelines were put in place precisely to deal with this issue of essentially facilities that cannot be substituted. So if you've got a facility out there that literally is either the only one or, or one which, which is essential for the, for, the, for the purpose of delivering communications. And I think we all know that we've, we've, we've probably cracked it on the international side. We're getting there in terms of national backbone. On local access is where we have the bottlenecks in South Africa. So I don't think that, you know, at face value, there's no question that we have a challenge with access to customers generally in, in the industry. And certainly local loop unbundling is one of those obvious interventions that has been used very successfully in, in other countries. Um, you know, even based on, the, on the, the, the latest numbers, we're talking about probably four million lines in South Africa that, that would be eligible for local loop unbundling. Um, and that's a substantial number of, uh, of businesses and homes and so on that are connected. So yes, we have moved on in technology. Yes, we can put fiber in. Yes, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, radio alternatives today. But certainly you can't just discount something like uh, copper-based access because, frankly, it is still the dominant means of broadband access in the world. Andre, but some of the copper is outdated and some of the lines have not been looked after. Should we gain access to the copper loop, who is responsible for then upkeeping and maintaining its high capital cost intensive to then gain access? Who's, who's going to take on that capital responsibility? <laughs> well, in the, in the current model and in the local loop unbundling model worldwide, that responsibility stays with the incumbent uh, who owns that copper today. And the fact that it hasn't been maintained properly is obviously a huge problem because you can unbundle and you can, you can move to that next step. But you know, those few hundred meters or few kilometers to the customer's premise is still critical. Um, and when there's quality problems on that last leg, then everything else upstream you know, is still problematic. But that responsibility will lie with Telcom. But how do you enforce that? Why would I find you've gained access to my lines? Why should I look after you who's essentially tapping into something I put in a number of years ago? And certainly Telcom will have that argument, but uh, it's because the regulator and the Department of Communication says you must. It is as simple as that. Unless they do it, Telcom will say, no, I won't do it. And this is really where we're coming back to uh, the effectiveness of our regulator and the effectiveness of our Department of Communications in enforcing um, LLU and making uh, sure that we have better wholesale models uh, for ISPs and for other telecoms operators uh, to function in. As I mentioned, if you ask Telcom, they will just say, no, we won't. Kathleen, but how do we get the regulator to have as much bite as it has bark? Because as you say, to date, not so much maybe growing a backbone now, but there really hasn't been the push. Should it be pressure from the industry and consumers who want to gain access to get those price reductions? I think that the regulator needs to be more empowered. Over the years, there's been interference from the Department of Communications. It's under-resourced, and um, they claim they don't have the ability to exercise its, its full mandate. So there should be a parallel process where the regulator is empowered and it's able to flex its, its muscles independently of government and fulfill its mandate as an independent regulator. But we've literally been seeing changes. We've had how many ministers of communication in the last four to five mm -hmm. years? How do you find that balance, though, between the government and the regulatory body who, body who has been mandated to do this? It's, it's a difficult um, balance to strike because there is a relationship between the department and ICASA. 
um, but it causes mandators to consider policies and policy directions passed by the minister. But um, its foremost responsibility, which is constitutionally protected, is to act as an independent body, free from political and commercial interference. So the whole appointment of ICASA councillors needs to be looked at, funding needs to be looked at, um, because uh, ICASA can be controlled indirectly through the appointment of councillors and the imposition of key performance indicators and financing. Angus, when it comes to engaging with ICASA and ICASA, ICASA engaging with, with the industry, is that is enough being uh, taken place? Look, I mean, we've, we've certainly had very active engagement with the regulator over a number of different issues. And certainly it's, it's true we find that, that there, is a, there is a challenge with capacity. Um, but certainly we've, we've not found that there's a fundamental unwillingness to, to, to regulate. I think what is a bit challenging is that there are... There's, there's often a, a bit of a disconnect in, in understanding where the policy should be and, and where, uh, where regulation is at any one time. So, I mean, certainly on, on local loop unbundling, the policy has not changed. I mean, the mm -hmm. policy absolutely states that local loop unbundling was to be in place by November last year. So I don't think we have a policy gap there. No one's ever said we shouldn't have it. Um, so I think really it does come down to a question of implementation and a question of, the, uh, of, of being able to... Uh, to, to regulate effectively. One of the challenges, and, and, and one must defend Dikasa in this, in this respect, one of the challenges with local loop unbundling is that uh, depending on, on how willing all the parties are to, to, to play the game, uh, it does require very careful regulation. Uh, facilities leasing is, is sufficient in, in legal terms to make local loop un, uh, available. Your, the challenge is really how do you actually do that in practice? So what kind of regulations do you need? We've had very good precedent for regulations that have been very well drafted, that work very well. The, the one that we're very familiar with is the, is the number portability regulations. We have a very f effective set of number portability regulations that on a, on a monthly basis we see continuous porting of numbers. That works very well, but it is 100 pages of regulations and it's detailed. How do you get to practical implementation? There needs to be a will. Um, you mentioned it early on. Um, you know, we've been we've been going around in circles for a long time. As you said, lots of changes in leadership um, and ICASA's ability to regulate um, is seriously in doubt. So we have to get to the point where the minister and the will just makes it happen. And again, if we're aiming for a big bang, fix it all in one approach, I suspect we'll be in five years' time and have the same conversation. Mm -hmm. We've got to find a way where we can start getting incremental benefit. And once again, we have to look at a phased approach. Um, you cannot build this thing in a big bang approach. Um, and if we're battling to get out the blocks, then a phased approach is even a better, a better way to get going. And, and some of that's already, in a very small way, happened. There was a reduction in IPC pricing, which was one of the, the, the sort of pressure points that, uh, that came out of the discussions initially. So there's an indication that the phased approach um, is the right way, um, but we, you know, we're certainly not seeing the next steps. The, the danger one has with phased approaches is, is, is timing. Um, we, you know, there's no, there's no problem with a phased approach to regulation, but a phased approach where the, where the first milestone is, is, is some years away isn't really going to get us anywhere. So I, I do think that the challenge is, is, is really the speed at which regulation can happen.